Good evening. That works well. Wow, I don't get that at home. Nobody stops when I start talking at home, or in my classes, it turns out. Uh, I, I have the great honor of welcoming you this evening uh, to, I believe it is our now 10th uh, Macrina Memorial uh, Lecture. This is part of a lecture series uh, that is named after a colleague of ours uh, who passed away now 10 years ago uh, in April of uh, 2011. Uh, and his name was Barry Macrina. He was a, well, I, sh I guess I should introduce myself and then I'll tell you Barry's story. My name is Tim Casey, uh, I'm professor of political science. Uh, been here, I think, since Dirt was still young. Uh, it feels like that anyway. Uh, for about 25 years, I've been uh, teaching here uh, in the political science department, the social and behavioral science department, I guess, technically. Um, and, it, it, and it was my great honor uh, to be mentored by uh, Barry Macrina. Barry was a anthropology professor here, <clears throat> and uh, he's a really an interesting character. Uh, Barry was uh, born in Pennsylvania, uh, really a son of Pennsylvania. He was a diehard uh, Steelers fan, so I like that about him. Uh, he was also a diehard, diehard pi Pirates fan, so we had that sympathy for him. Um, you know, but Barry was, was just, he was a salt of the earth kind of person. Um, and he came to anthropology not as his first love. Actually, he started his academic career uh, at, at Penn State, and he got a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in chemistry. Uh, and then he got a PhD in agronomy. Uh, and then he went to work for a while uh, for Eastman Kodak, back when they were, I guess, still using chemicals to process film or whatever. Uh, and had some sort of a midlife uh, awakening or crisis or whatever you want to call it, uh, and went back to um, get his degree in anthropology. Now let me double check and make sure I know where that happened. But Binghamton, Binghamton. SUNY Binghamton. All right, absolutely. Um, so he was, he was at State University of New York in Binghamton uh, and got an anthropology degree and, and shifted entirely, right? From a chemist to an anthropologist is a bit of a shift, really. Um, and, and he came here, um, first started actually writing and studying uh, the people in his own, um, in his own home uh, landscape, uh, and that is the coal miners in western Pennsylvania. Uh, and he wrote a book on the coal miners, and then when he was hired here at CMU, uh, he, which was Mesa State at the time, he fell in love with the American Southwest, and particularly the, uh, the native peoples of the Southwest, and especially uh, the Ute, uh, who you know, occupied and dwelled and still dwell in this landscape that we share uh, with them. And so uh, Barry became uh, a, a scholar, uh, a champion, an advocate for uh, indigenous studies here at CMU. Um, and it was, you know, he was also the editor of uh, the Vignettes, which was an anthropology collection um, of, of, of studies that we did for quite some time. He was a distinguished faculty member in 1997. He was, as I have mentioned, a great colleague and friend. And so when he passed away suddenly in 2011, uh, we thought about maybe, you know, putting out a bench somewhere with his name on it or a tree with his name on it. And, and we decided that what Barry would really love is a lecture series where at least once a year we gather and we talk about the intersection between indigenous uh, studies and indigenous lives and the lives of everyone else uh, who has come here. Uh, and so we've invited a whole series of scholars over the years to come and, and have that conversation with us. Not only did we do that, but we also set up a memorial fund. I'll be doing a cheap and shameless plug for that uh, scholarship um, at the end of the evening. Uh, but in that memorial fund, we tried to set up a scholarship for indigenous students uh, that would, would be able to come here and attend CMU. And so we thought this would seem to be a fitting legacy. Uh, so I have to thank my colleagues uh, from the Social and Behavioral Science Department and from Language and Literature, Mass Communication Department, uh, our resident uh, poet laureate, which you'll meet in just a few moments, uh, who've been on this committee for years, uh, just really out of a service uh, in the honor and memory of, uh, of a dear colleague and a dear friend and a mentor, I think, to all of us. Um, unfortunately, our, our speaker tonight was, was, was not uh, able to, to, to teach at the same time as Barry was here. He came about three years after Barry. Uh, but I think he really uh, 
personifies Barry's spirit in so many ways and really brings, on, brings that home. So I'm so delighted to introduce him, but that'll come later in the conversation. Um, one of the things that Barry is, is best known for in his anthropology, what, he was a big fan of, of hermeneutics, which is a, a study, a, a way of studying that tries to begin to really understand somebody else's perspective by trying to, as, as Gadamir, who is a great um, scholar in hermeneutics, would say, fusing the horizon of my world and your world so it becomes our world. And so what Barry was really trying to do, um, you know, is, is understand the Ute, understand his students, understand anybody. He was, he was sort of hermeneutic everywhere. Um, but it was really a, a, a neat way in which we begin to open up a dialogue, maintain our uniqueness, and yet also recognize our common grounds and, and the things that bring us together. Barry was uh, so honored uh, by the Ute uh, that he was studying that they gave him a name, uh, which fits very well. Barry, if you didn't know Barry, Barry was, was really, really tall. I don't know how tall, but I always looked up to him, both figuratively and, li and literally. But his name was, in Ute, let me get this straight now, standing as tall as the sky. And so that was his Ute name, the translation of his Ute name. Um, and it really, I think, fit Barry. Um, he's an eclectic individual, uh, a, a great lover of poetry. So if you've noticed, I know we did not get enough programs printed because this is a great turnout and crowd, so I'm super excited about that. Um, but if you do see the programs, you see there's poetry involved. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But Barry was a poet as well and, and, and deeply supportive of poetry movement among the faculty here and contributing his own. So we always like to add some of that. But before we go any further, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn the stage over to Sadie Kelly. And Sadie is uh, the, the I don't, I, I'm not going to get your title right. It's the Native American Student Association, and you are the director, chief in, 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 in charge of all things uh, Wonder Woman and political science student, which I guess is redundant with Wonder Woman, of course. Uh, but anyway, Sadie, Sadie is, is Oneida Creek, Kiowa, Comanche, and Shoshone Paiute. And she's going to come uh, and join us and encourage us to acknowledge the land in which we stand. Sigali Swagwe, Gibel Hawi, Nim Gets, Wagen Yatat, Nivikita Loda, Okali, Oniota Aga, Nibadun Hunjoda. Hello, everyone. My name is Yuwil Hawi. My English name is Sadie. I'm Turtle Clan, and the people of Standing Stone is the land and earth that I come from. I am the new head coordinator of the Native American Student Association. Our main goal this school year was to get a land acknowledgement implemented into campus events. I'm honored to debut this acknowledgement today. The region served by Colorado Mesa University occupies the ancestral home of the Northern Ute Nation, who have persisted here in Western Colorado before recorded history to the present day. The Colorado Mesa University campus exists upon lands ceded from the Northern and Southern Ute tribe. We acknowledge this land we stand upon today as sacred, historical, and significant to the Northern Ute. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on this land and for you to seek to understand your place within that history. This brief statement is a way of remembering the lives and history lost while giving visibility to indigenous people who can continue to live and strive today. Danito Yawanko, that is it, thank you. As I mentioned, Barry was an eclectic individual and poetry was among the things that, that moved Barry very deeply as it does I think for many of us. Um, and I think he always wanted to to help people understand how poetry captures the heart and the spirit in a way that sometimes the more academic pursuits that we do, not that poetry is not academic, so forgive me, my literature friends, um, but the, the, the more sort of heady stuff that we might be hearing later, uh, 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 you know, now I'm, I'm really getting into it. Never mind. <laughs> the point is, poetry inspires the soul. And we have a poet laureate. He is uh, transitioning uh, toward retirement, uh, ever, ever closer all the time. Uh, but a longtime uh, colleague and friend, uh, Professor John Nizolowski, will join us with some poetry. This is rather intense. I haven't done a reading in front of people for two and a half years. So um, 
it's quite a, quite a moment. Uh, as has been said, um, Barry Macrina was a, a, a beloved colleague and friend. Uh, he and I shared a lot, uh, <clears throat> including our um, Slavic heritage. Uh, we both went to SUNY Binghamton, um, not at the same time. Uh, and I learned late in, in uh, his time here that he was a fellow poet and essayist. And it was uh, uh, another facet of his very, very interesting uh, person, right? So um, I was thinking tonight, uh, you know, I always do some poetry, you know, before the, before the main talk, and I always read something of Barry's, but, uh, and then usually something of mine. Tonight's uh, subject um, uh, chose the poems for me. Uh, in 2012, a woman named Miranda Washinawatak, who was uh, at that time 12 years old, a uh, Menominee girl, she was disciplined uh, at a Catholic school in Wisconsin for saying the words, hello, and I love you, to a fellow student in her native language, for which she was reprimanded. And the away schools, the boarding schools, uh, one of the great damages that they caused was to erode uh, native culture. And part of that erosion, a big part of that erosion, was forbidding the use of uh, native language in these schools. It was literally beaten out of the children. So this was a, a kind of contemporary, uh, you know, sort of shadow of this past. Uh, in solidarity to uh, Miranda, um, Padma Thornlier, who's the publisher of Turkey Buzzard Press, put out a call for poems using the words, hello and I love you, uh, in the ancestral language of, of the poet. Uh, and then he gathered these poems uh, in a uh, collection called uh, Poso Ketapanen, The Hello, I Love You Project. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read two poems from here. Uh, one is, uh, the first one is mine, my entry, and then the other one is uh, Phil Woods, a Denver poet. And uh, I thought I was going to be safe with my Polish pronunciation, but I didn't know Brad was going to be here. So it's like, oh no. 1926, repeated history. When my father was a boy, he spoke no English at all. So on the day he appeared at school for the first time, the other children mocked as he greeted the teacher, Czech. He said, not hello. Laughter covered the room like oily swamp water. No, the teacher said portentously, do not speak Polish here. You are in America now. After school, some of the older boys lurked in the second cutting hay fields that lined my father's way. He took a fierce beating remembered it years later so he could tell his children. But he also told of coming home filled with pain, confusion, and fear. And so his mother took him in her arms and said, Ya she kokcham, I love you. And then this is silenced by Phil Woods. Why was it so necessary to cut black Indian hair in the boarding schools? Why must some be silenced? Does a new city on a hill require humiliation and silence? Why, why we don't like to talk about King Philip's war. We don't like to remember what John Winthrop said about that war's liquidated dead. But a teacher in Wisconsin decided a new silence was a solemn need 
you think surely we've moved past some terrible errors. The American shadow eats whole languages and peoples. But words of love cannot be silenced. New voices in many tongues remember and never stop saying, I love you. And then I'm going to end here with a poem by Barry Macrina that I think reflects the endurance of uh, native culture, Ute culture specifically in this case. And this is called Sunrise at the Sundance. Diffuse light, silence, four drum beats, singers entering lodge, cowboy hats and ball caps, metal drumsticks looking like cattails, hushed male voices in laughter, impassioned singing, drum beating in chest, rising dancers, whistles sing, four dancers running to pole, eyes up, dancing back, downy feathers held high, then all dancers rising, moving to center, facing entrance, traditional sunrise song, the onlookers turn to face east, bright sky above the horizon, all look, the sun breaks the horizon, hands reaching out, palms out, sunlight embraced, sunlight swept to head, sunlight caught and patted on arms, sun fully rises, men finish drumming, women singing softly, the song ends, 22 eagle whistles sing loud and long. Thank you. I promise this will be the last time. I'm just going to introduce our speaker. But I also just want to call your attention uh, very briefly to the, uh, the program. If you have the program, there's a listing of our scholarship recipients, including our most recent scholarship recipient, uh, Tristan Charles, 2021 uh, Macrina Scholarship recipient. Is Tristan in the house? No. OK. It's all right, Tristan is probably studying and making good use of that scholarship. So um, the, the CMU Foundation uh, is, the, is the organization that manages our scholarships. Um, and so if you feel so moved uh, that you want to contribute uh, to a scholarship uh, and contribute to the Macrina Scholarship, you can contact the foundation. So that'll be my cheap and shameless plug to encourage you to think about doing that. Uh, and any little bit uh, can help. And I think it's really important um, to, to make sure that we, we give support to our, our students, um, you know, in all scholarships, but certainly our Native students uh, in this Macrina Scholarship. So now, without further ado, it is my great honor uh, to introduce my colleague in archaeology and anthropology, which um, he has taught me over and over again is not a distinct field. The two are the same field, essentially. It just depends, I guess, on how, how, off, how long ago uh, you start studying things. So uh, Dr. John Seabach joined us here at CMU in 2014. Um, the, the sign says assistant professor, and I was giving him a little bit of a hard time at, uh, at the back because he's actually now been promoted to associate professor uh, of archaeology. Um, that, that, there you go. Um, and it is... And so the program isn't technically wrong because I guess technically that doesn't happen until the fall uh, formally uh, in the way in which we do things, but it is already a done deal. Um, John has been studying anthropology uh, and archaeology for, for a long time. He uh, has his degrees, uh, his bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, his master's and PhD from Southern Methodist University. Uh, and then he had a, a, a brief stint over on that other side of the mountain, uh, the Front Range of Colorado at Front Range Community College before uh, joining us here. And, uh, and so John does, you know, sort of really ancient stuff. Uh, but this particular project uh, is near and dear to his heart and his passion. Uh, and this project is to, to tell the story, to begin to understand the story and, and, and give credence and honor to the story of uh, a boarding school here in Grand Junction. One that I think if I remember you telling this story before, maybe you'll tell how you got into this in the first place, but 
Uh, it was really because he started talking to his students and none of the students had any idea that such a school existed right here in Grand Junction. And many of them were from Grand Junction. And so uh, I think that's sort of sparked his intellectual curiosity as well as his passion uh, for Native people. And so he began to start digging, uh, as any good researcher does. And what you're about to hear is the results of that, that work. Uh, John was given the very first ever uh, Human Scale University Champion Award here at CMU last year by the Board of Trustees uh, in December, I believe, um, or November, or something like that. I don't know, it was vague. Uh, some time when it was cold. Um, anyway, John, and what that means really is that he exemplifies uh, among our faculty and among our staff uh, the kind of commitment uh, to the human story and not just uh, processing numbers and, 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 and making sure tuition comes in and all these sorts of things, but really engaging in meaningful change in people's lives. Um, and part of what he does is through this, through this research. So. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce uh, Dr. John Seabach, and he will help you learn a bit more about the Grand Junction Boarding School. Well, this is quite a crowd. Thank you all very much uh, for bestowing me with the, the honor of speaking with you tonight. <clears throat> um, so as you have heard, my talk tonight is going to be about Grand Junction's Indian Boarding School, sort of a... Uh, a lost history of Grand Junction. And while I tell the story, I'm going to take you uh, on various asides about the, um, the kinds of education that one might receive at these schools, as well as uh, what life was like here in Grand Junction at this particular school. And then talk about some of the research I've been doing to make sure that this school is not forgotten. So, let us begin. First, I, gotta, I always have to figure out how to use these things. Aha. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to start in 2016, and this is when I got uh, involved in all of this. And what you're looking at is a um, Senate bill that hit the Colorado legislature. And essentially, it seems, you know, very kind of nondescript. It basically says that this uh, Grand Junction Regional Center campus would be vacated and sold. And this, uh, this piece of legislation, just this was it. This was what it said. And it had no recognition of the place that they were talking about. It was just, we are going to sell this money losing property and um, make some money on the sale that we can put into state coffers. What they did not recognize as part of this well, this is the Grand Junction Regional Center. Uh, it sits between, uh, on Riverside Parkway. How, where's the laser on this thing? Let me see. Boom, boom, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Riverside Parkway, and over here is 29 Road, and then this is Indian Wash Road, which I suppose would be something like 28 and a half, or something along those lines. And so if you've driven down Riverside Parkway, you have absolutely seen this um, property. This is what the legislature was trying to sell. What they didn't recognize as part of that bill is that the regional center is just one small part of a campus that used to be just under 170 acres of land, and that was once the Grand Junction Indian School, one of the um, notorious, depending on who you ask, uh, Indian boarding schools, off-reservation Indian boarding schools that was designed to assimilate American Indian children into dominant Euro-American culture. This is the school as it sat in probably about 1900, something along those lines based on the buildings that we see there. And um, it was a major part of Grand Junction's cultural landscape at the time that it was running. The lapse in memory that we see in the Colorado legislature is actually not very uncommon. It's, um, it's something that happens when we talk about uh, native education, indigenous education in general uh, at any level. There seems to be a, um, a sort of cultural disjunct or maybe even a, um, 
an ignorance of, or you know, perceived ignorance of, the kinds of things that the federal government did to assimilate indigenous children into our culture. It's just one of those blind spots that we've grown up with as a culture, in, in a culture that basically ignores native issues at all levels, to say nothing of the history of how the conditions uh, came to be in the first place. And because of that bill that was going to have this place sold, it's really sad because this very important history, this critical history in the life of Grand Junction and in the life of indigenous communities in and around the Southwest is quite specifically, quite um, literally in physical and memorial jeopardy. As Dr. Casey said, I have talked to many, many, many classes of students and um, of all ages, college age, high school age, um, you know, just all over the state from the front range in many places here on, on the West Slope. And I would say, you know, conservatively, about 97 to 98% of the people in my audiences have no idea that this even happened or that there were such things as Indian boarding schools generally. So let me give you a brief education, or a brief uh, introduction into what these schools were all about. <clears throat> we're gonna start way back at the beginning before any school had actually opened. And the architects of what we call native education um, are these two. There's an anthropologist, as much as I hate to say it, uh, 19th century anthropology was very much filled with um, racist ideas. And Lewis Henry Morgan was one of these anthropologists who believed in a process that is called social evolution. The next slide will take you through that. And then the um, bottom individual there is Captain, Captain uh, Richard Henry Pratt. And he was the guy that came up with this whole idea of educating slash assimilating native youth to begin with. And what happened with him was is he took a, uh, a series of POWs from, um, from Civil War, essentially, and the Indian Wars, and he took them to jail in Florida. And while they were inmates in this jail, he taught them to read and write English, and from this idea, he said, you know what? We can do this on a grand scale. So first, the social evolution part. Lewis Henry Morgan, extremely influential in um, academic circles, had this idea that all human cultures, no matter what, no matter where you were on the planet, that all human cultures went through three stages of evolution. That at one time, we all started in the stage that he called savagery. And that as we took on various other cultural ways of being, we evolved, we rose up into the stage of barbarism. And that after a few years in barbarism, if you took on more things, then you, were, you got to call yourself civilized. Now notice what makes up some of these categories. If you're a savage, quote unquote, then you're a mobile forager. You're a person that has no private property. You're a person that um, does not live in a home with four walls. You basically, the entire landscape is something that you feel deep, very deeply for as you move around uh, exploiting the kinds of food resources, water resources, and other things that you need to stay alive. It's basically hunting and gathering. Indiscriminate mating, this of course was part of that um, racism that I, that I uh, talked about before. Um, it was thought that if you were not chaste, right, if you were not um, a Puritan with regard to sexual relations, that you were a savage, you, were, you mated indiscriminately, and so on, right? Once we had plant domestication, then you went over into barbarism. Why? Because that meant that you stayed in one place. That meant that you might have an idea of property and that this property belongs to you. And so you got to be a barbarian now. And then once you learned all the benefits of capitalism, industrialism, monotheism, monogamy, you gotta get away from that indiscriminate mating, democracy, 
political states and patriarchy, that's literally in there, right? That your society had to be patriarchal because, you know, God forbid that you were matriarchal over here. That's, that's for savages, right? Once you learned all of this stuff and you were civilized, you made it to the top. Now, of course, Morgan, being who he was, had, you know, slotted in various different cultures into these different categories. And as you might imagine, Western European and American culture were the only ones that had made it into the civilized category. Everyone else got filtered out into one of these other ones. And when it came to American Indian populations, American Indian communities, of which Morgan was actually um, quite educated. He did ethnographic work among the, uh, the Haudenosaunee in New York. Uh, all native peoples to him were either savages, this at one time was a scientific term, right? Was, were savages because they were mobile foragers, or if you lived in the Southwest, or maybe in upstate New York and places like that, and you had corn, you grew maize, then you could be called a barbarian. But in no case was any native community outside of these two categories here. And so from Morgan's perspective, from other you know, contemporary American perspectives, Native American communities were deficient, literally, in many, many, many things. And so this deficiency needed to be redressed. Pratt, on the other hand, when he's decided that we could do this on a much bigger scale, he was given some money and he founded the very first Indian boarding school in Pennsylvania, the Carlisle Industrial School. And when he founded this school, he believed that the motto of Indian education should be a quote that I'm sure many people in here have heard before, kill the Indian and save the man. Now what he was referring to here was that the purpose, the very purpose of these institutions was to somehow take students, lift native ways of seeing the world, lift indigenous languages, lift indigenous religious uh, ideas or spirituality, cosmology, whatever, lift it out of the child, throw it away, and replace all of that with Euro-American ideals, monotheism, patriarchy, private property, industry, and so on, right? That you had to unlearn everything that you'd learned up to that point, in order to be, have it replaced with this other stuff over here. And when you really stop to think about this, this was an insidious way of thinking. This was a really, really dangerous way of thinking because he specifically said that he was going to do this with children. Okay, with children. So if you took enough indigenous children away took them far away from their homes and ensconced them in these far, far away schools and did not let them speak their languages or do other things that, that Professor Nizolowski talked about, right? That you could quite literally decimate indigenous ways of being and seeing the world in several generations. Because once they were gone, once you took them out of the children, the children could not teach them to future generations. So they, they went after the children as a matter of strategy in doing this. So we had Morgan's ideas and Pratt's educational system, which ended up with another very famous thing, which I'm sure many people in here have seen, these kinds of photos, where you have these three young Lakota men who were put on a train in South Dakota and shipped east to Carlisle, to Pennsylvania. And when they, were, when they got to Carlisle, there they are in their native dress, right? With culturally appropriate hairstyles, culturally appropriate beadwork, culturally appropriate feathers, meaning that they had achieved some kind of prestige rank in their society, even as young men. And after getting there, what happened? They got a change of clothes. They got haircuts, and they were supposed to now be acting 
like American citizens, quote unquote, American citizens. So you rid all of the native trappings in order to produce this. And they wanted to replicate this everywhere. Now the federal policy at the time was assimilation. The federal government's um, relationship to uh, native nations has ping-ponged in a number of different ways. Um, the very first stage of federal Indian relations was treaty making. And at the time, right, Congress is the only body that can make and sign treaties only with other sovereign nations. So the very first treaties, hundreds, right, were signed with native peoples as equals, as sovereign nations. That was the first thing. Then after the federal government said, well, we didn't really mean that part, right? We didn't mean the sovereign nations. Oh, just a little aside. Uh, I don't know how many people in here knew that in the original treaties, the Delaware tribe and the Cherokee were supposed to have representation in Congress, which they still have never gotten, okay? Um, after they, they said enough of the treaties, then they went to either a plan of assimilation or extermination, depending on whatever president happened to be in the office at the time. Perhaps the best uh, example of extermination was the Trail of Tears, where southeastern tribes were removed from their homes and pushed in very trying conditions, a lot of death along the way, into Oklahoma or Indian country. This happened to be an assimilation. The boarding schools happened to be an assimilation part of that policy. So, according to Pratt, this is what they were going to do. They were going to open a series of residential boarding schools in which indigenous kids would get the equivalent of an eighth grade education. They were also going to be trained in some kind of industrial art, blacksmithing, horseshoeing, laundress, those kinds of things, where they could get out of, graduate from school, and go out and get jobs, right? Industrialism, capitalism, that kind of thing, right? So we had to be able to give them skills to get jobs. And then critically, the other part of it was the very first thing that they were gonna do was they were gonna take these kids, put them back on a train, send them back to their home communities with the express idea that they would teach this to older generations and younger generations. So not only was the assimilation going to happen in the schools themselves, if the plan was going to work as they originally built it, the assimilation was also going to happen within Indian communities on the reservations. Eventually, the government opened 25 of these schools all across the nation, and those joined hundreds of schools that were built on reservations, and then several other hundreds of schools that were put together by religious organizations. <clears throat> the very first one was Carlisle there in Pennsylvania. That opened in 1879. The model was considered to be so successful that they opened four new schools in 1884, Oklahoma, Albuquerque, um, uh, Kansas, and Nebraska. And then, in 1886, they built one here. There are so many indigenous peoples in this general area of the world that they decided to build another one in Colorado as well, Fort Lewis, which was originally in Hesperus in 1892. So there were two of these assimilation factories in um, Colorado during this era. So let's talk a little bit about what was going on at Grand Junction. A little bit of history for you. Here on the West Slope, the Ute were officially quote unquote removed in 1880 and 1881. They were taken to Utah originally, right? Pushed out into Utah originally. And that left the West Slope open for white settlement, right? This is what they thought, how they pitched it at the time. Grand Junction was founded in 1882 by a man named George Crawford who brought his family out here and his brother 
owned a whole lot of land in the valley as well, Thomas Crawford. And in 1885, the very same Thomas Crawford decided to deed 170 acres of land that he owned to the federal government in order to build this boarding school. Now, I want you to consider what that means, right? And here's one of the original do whoop, documents here, right? County of Mesa, IJA Layton, he recorded blah, blah, blah. Then it's all kinds of legalese, but this was the original document that went to the Mesa County recorder. Um, he set this aside very, very early in Grand Junction's history. It used to be that when these things were first being opened, communities would fight over the right to have them because what it represented was all the building contracts went to local builders, all the supplies like meat, flour, coffee, you know, whatever, staples would be purchased in town. Bricks would be purchased from wherever bricks came from, you know, locally or what have you. The whole operation pumped money into, um, into communities. And so there were literally booster committees that were trying to get these uh, campuses opened in their community. I mean, after all, Grand Junction had only been founded four years before, and there were already people that were pushing to have one of these institutions here. So this was an extremely important part of the rise of, or the history of Grand Junction. Excuse me while I drink some water. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> The original building was opened in 1886. At the time, this school was a one-room schoolhouse, right? 170 acres with one building on it. This building, when it was opened, was a boys' dorm, classrooms, superintendent's quarters, dining hall. The whole shebang was in this one building. Um, the very first class, as it shows there, 69 Ute boys were um, accepted into the school at the time. And that was basically how it went for the first couple of years out here at this school. It was a very, very small affair. Had looked nothing like some of the bigger schools in the system like Carlisle or Haskell or what have you. This was just a, just a rural little place. In fact, it was so small that the federal government was talking about closing it as early as 1888. It just wasn't pulling in the numbers. It wasn't doing the job of assimilation that they wanted it to do. In addition, the land that was donated for this particular school was very poor with regard to agriculture, okay? So the poor soils there meant that any kind of industrial arts involving farming, orchard keeping, what have you, was already off on a bad foot because you couldn't do much with this land. They also didn't have any irrigation. They had to get shares. The government had to get shares in the Grand Valley Irrigation Company. The government was always trying, or the, the irrigation company was always trying to gouge the government. I can't tell you how many legal documents I've had to go through that is just fighting and wrangling between the irrigation companies and the federal government. But essentially, the irrigation companies twice shut off water to the school, right? And it was difficult to recruit students. Here's what happened. In the grand scheme of things, right, native parents are not stupid. They see the writing on the wall and they know that American ways of life are going to dominate everything from coast to coast from here on out. And as any parent would want their child to succeed, there were many parents that said, okay, go off to this school and get your education and hopefully you will, you know, it will benefit you in some way, right? But up until 1888 or even like 1890, somewhere in there, the education at Grand Junction was terrible. You couldn't grow fruit, you couldn't grow agricultural products, you didn't have a blacksmithing shop, you had nothing. And so youth parents at the time were just like, why are we sending our kids out there? They're not getting anything for it, 
They're just suffering for no reason. And so the youth decided that they were no longer going to send their kids to Grand Junction. And it became a fight to recruit students to come to this school because nobody would come out here. Then in 1890, none other than the Commissioner of Indian Affairs himself, a man by the name of Thomas Jefferson Morgan, he came out to Grand Junction to see what was up, right? Because these superintendents of the schools, they had to write yearly reports to the government, to the, um, the commissioner, and so the commissioners always knew what was going on at all of these schools. He wanted to see, well, what's going on in Grand Junction that it's just like terrible, such a terrible place and what have you. And so he came out here and meeting him here was Colorado Senator Henry Teller, and they both decided that this school needed to stay and that they were going to invest in this school and they were gonna bring all kinds of things here from industrial arts to better teachers in order to keep this school alive. And that's exactly what they did. After this big tranche of money from Morgan and Teller came into Grand Junction, all of a sudden the number of buildings and the opportunities on this campus swelled. They built a whole series of farming and ranching buildings. They were one of the places where Grand Junctioners would go and get their horses shooed. There was a farrier shed here, right? There was a dedicated classroom building, so they got people out of that one-stop shop and had people in a dedicated classroom. They had opened a girls' dorm, so now the school was accepting female students. They had a dining hall that was built, again, specifically for those purposes with a big, giant kitchen where people could learn to cook as well. This school became one of the jewels in the Indian education system. It really was. And furthermore, they actually said, um, Jefferson Morgan said that because of the, the weather out here, because the weather was so beautiful all the time, that this was like one of the health spas of the Indian service. Literally, that's a quote from him. Accordingly, the number of students grew. The smallest number of students that was ever at the school was in 1890, right before that visit from the Muckety Mucks from Washington. And um, there were seven students at the school, seven. After that tranche of money, the numbers of students kept going up, kept going up, kept going up until it reached the size of over 200. The class of 1908, I believe, was 216 students were here. So from nothing, it grew into quite a large educational institution. Here you can see the class of 1906. Notice again that you have your military style garb for boys. You've got sort of standard uh, female girl or girl dress at the time, right? Just kind of like a shift kind of thing. Um, you can see the teachers and the superintendents on either side. This was a big operation and it brought in a lot of money to Grand Junction. Now, the Ute never really wanted to send their kids here. And that was one of the reasons why Fort Lewis was opened down near Hesperus or in Hesperus, because the Ute felt better sending their, their kids, especially the Southern Ute, Ute Mountain Ute, sent their kids to Durango, essentially, and it was closer to the reservations that they had. So they felt a little bit better about that than sending them all the way up to Grand Junction. Nevertheless, over the years, several Ute students did come here, but the Grand Junction School was really cosmopolitan in terms of the number of nations represented. So we had a lot of people from Arizona. We have San Carlos Apache, Hopi, Navajo, Tohono O'odham, who used to be called Papago, Akimel O'odham, Pima, and um, so all from Arizona, right? Then we had some people from the Great Basin, the Paiutes. Then we had some people from the New Mexico Pueblos, 
the, kind, the actual Pueblos themselves, we don't know. The only one that's mentioned by name is Santo Domingo, which is now called Kewa. Ho-Chunk, or Winnebago peoples from Nebraska, and Cherokee from out east or from Oklahoma. So a lot of kids came here. But you can see how this would have been an ideal situation from the perspective of one of these boarding schools. Because again, if you're not allowed to speak your own language and you can't speak to anybody else, then there's no reason to use your language ever because it simply goes nowhere. So having this diverse student body was working for the government. Now again, this place was a cultural hub for Grand Junction. And there were lots of events that Grand Junctioners would go out to the school to go and see, including sporting events. There's the football team on their gridiron, which is just south in one of the southern areas of the campus. They had a girls' mandolin band that would travel up and down. Uh, well, throughout Grand Junction, Delta, Palisade, places like that, they weren't really allowed to go to the front range. Only the boys could go to the front range. Uh, the boy bands, so like in sync. Um, so, so the girls actually played a lot around here. And then here you have a write-up in the Grand Junction News from 1892 where they would actually talk about the different Christmas pageants, the different kinds of assemblies that we had, the plays that were put on, all kinds of stuff happened out here that Grand Junctioners were all about. They wanted to go and see this stuff, right? So there really was a portion of Grand Junction life that revolved around this school, which is really quite fascinating. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> obviously, it's not all fun and games, right? There is a very, very dark side to Indian education, and that is also apparent in Grand Junction. And so any discussion of what happened at these boarding schools is incomplete without talking about the conditions of life at one of these institutions. Over the years, it became difficult Native parents didn't want to send their kids to these schools when it became apparent what was happening there, when it became apparent that corporal punishment was being used to um, enforce rules of behavior. And so the government used lots and lots of insidious techniques in order to make sure that kids would come to these schools. And one of those techniques was straight up kidnapping. Here's a... Uh, one of the superintendents of Grand Junction School, he gave a talk in 1892. The entire talk is transcribed. It's fascinating to get inside the mind of one of these superintendents way back in 1892. But I just want you to read those first few words there. The first step in the education of Indian youth is to catch your youth. And the second step is to make your escape before the Indian adult catches you. This is putting the case rather stronger than facts may warrant. At the same time, I always feel just a little more comfortable when I am far enough away to take the burden from the magazine of the rifle. Right? So this is an acknowledgement of kidnapping, which we know happened. And we know that Native parents, Native families, did a, the best job that they possibly could when the Indian agents would come around to round up kids to go to the schools, they would hide their children. They would tell their children, go run over there, just go hide, get away, right? Go away, stay out there for a couple of days until they go away, and maybe you won't be taken. But in some cases, they were taken by force. Later on in this article, Another way that, this, uh, that Indian schools got children was um, at the time, I don't know how many of you know this, at the time, and to an extent, you know, these, this tradition, uh, this treaty right is continued to this day, Native peoples were absolutely dependent upon the federal government to get food, right? 
If you took a bunch of hunter-gatherers and you shoved them onto a reservation and said, you can't leave the fence of this reservation, when you hear someone say this person has gone off the reservation, that's a very, very dark thing that you're saying. Okay? Because what it means is, is that these people were herded onto reservations and made to stay within, inside the fence line. Okay? No more hunting and gathering. No more moving around. Nothing. And so they had no way of putting food in their mouths unless they took government rations. So one of the ways that you would get students at these schools was to threaten the parents by taking away their rations. So you wouldn't get any food unless you sent your son or daughter to one of these places. This is very, very cruel and is something that happened as a matter of course. We've talked a little bit about some of these before. Once kids arrived on the campus and had their hair cut, got their change of clothing, they were immediately slapped with some of these injunctions. You were not allowed to speak your native tongue anymore. Now, this was sharply enforced in classrooms, but based on diaries from various other Indian schools, particularly um, some uh, from Pipestone in Minnesota, one of the, the boarding schools there in Minnesota, you could get away with at least sometimes speaking on the playground, away from teachers. You know, you could go off to a corner of the school and have a conversation with someone that came from your nation, someone that spoke your same language, who knows, right? So it wasn't always enforced as, you know, as badly as that, but in classrooms, definitely it was enforced. You were required to take part in Christian religious instruction. All federal schools, right, separation of church and state, all federal schools had chapels and would bring in priests every Sunday to make sure that these kids would go to Sunday school and go to mass or go to a service of some kind. The punishments were all kinds of different punishments. Speaking your language could get you your mouth washed out with lie. Imagine what that was like. Um, you could just be spanked, hit, whatever, something along those lines, corporal punishment. Shame-based, there are records of kids at Grand Junction, boys, who were forced to dress as girls, put on girls' clothing, and parade around the campus, okay? So there was a lot of stuff that could go bad for you if you broke any of these rules. Grand Junction also maintained three jail cells on the campus, such that if you were really breaking rules, you were a complete miscreant, you would be put into one of these cells, and each one was solitary confinement. So you got put in there for an undisclosed period of time. I've never found anybody say it was one day, two days, five days, whatever. And you were just left in there until you could learn to behave. All right. So all in all, of course, this led to untold cultural loss. The language loss alone is just immense. And when you think about language as a vehicle of culture, from the stories we tell, from just transmitting knowledge back and forth from one another, when you talk about the loss of language alone, right, the amount or the degree of cultural, not the amount, the degree of cultural loss just based on that alone is unimaginable, just unimaginable. And this is one of the things that has directly led to the intergenerational trauma that we know occurs in Indian communities to this day, right? That loss of language, that loss of culture, that loss of a, of a, of a connection, right? And this was all at the hands of federal policy. You know, this was what was designed. These, these schools were doing what they were designed to do. <clears throat> Given the medical treatments at the time, and given the fact that you had a bunch of kids boarding on these campuses, many of them got sick. There were epidemic diseases that would um, rip through the campuses every now and again, all over the country. At Grand Junction, we know from records, they had outbreaks of measles, TB, diphtheria, flu, 
and trachoma. Trachoma is an eye disease that would lead to blindness. Now, sometimes, of course, people would not get better from these diseases or they would get into accidents or something along those lines and they would die while on campus. And here's one of the, again, most insidious things about one of these, one of these places. Once you were in, you didn't get out. If you died while you were on campus, you were buried on campus. And you were buried in Christian traditions, buried in ways that are so far removed from the proper way to treat the dead in your home community that this, again, just is symbolic of this complete and total disregard for Indian ways of life and literally trying to eradicate Indian ways of seeing uh, from the United States. Now I wanna pause here real quick because the next slide has the names of some deceased individuals that we know of on campus. I'm gonna read two names aloud. They are both of Tohono O'odham peoples. And so if you are Diné or Nde, then do whatever is appropriate before these names are read. So I'll wait just a couple of seconds. Okay. <clears throat> we know there are at least 24 people buried in the Grand Junction Cemetery. We think it's about well, I've uncovered records of maybe 26, but the like just straight up records we have is definitely at least 24. There are probably many more than 26 because the records are poor. Here you have a list of names, when they died, their age at death, how they died, and their tribal affiliation. More than the names and more than the causes of death, I want you to look at all the question marks or at all the unknowns. This is the level of record keeping that these schools kept about their students. We have people whose tribal affiliation, unknown. We have people whose names, unknown. Their ages, we don't know, right? There is a serious lack of detail when it comes to some of these burials, yet, this is what we have. But if you dig hard enough, you can put some more stuff together. Wait, go. Talise Martin, literally in the build up to this talk when I was going back through some archival documents and reading them word for word, some ones that I had not really paid attention to since coming back from Washington DC, uh, I found that I could put a name on one of those anonymous females based on her date of death and her appendicitis. Talise Martin now has a name, so that's been very, very fulfilling uh, to do that. Even placing one name up on the list is a fulfilling job when it used to be someone who was just anonymous. And then we also, I just found another record which would make maybe 27 people I don't know how he would have pronounced his, the name that he was given at this school. It's not his birth name, but let's just say Serafico Velasco. He died in 1909, but there's no telling what became of his remains. I assume that they're in the school cemetery, but I don't know. I don't have records for that. So it's quite a thing to know that you have an arm tied behind your back if you're even trying to get good records on who was there. All right, so let's get into the final years a little bit. What happened to this place after all these years? Well, a new commissioner came into power in 1905, and this commissioner had, for the times at least, uh, more liberal views on native peoples, more um, accommodative views on native ways of life. And he wanted to shut down the boarding schools. He thought and wrote that they were a failure 
And the reason why he said they were a failure is because what you ended up doing then was you ended up robbing these children of their culture, sending them back into their home communities, and then as they went back into their home communities, they did not have that cultural knowledge or had not gone through the rites of passage that were necessary to be considered an adult in those communities, right? They might not have got their proper naming ceremony at the right time. They might not have gotten their puberty ceremony at the right time. They did not go through those critical stages with their people. Thus, hello? Okay, all right. Thus, they went back to their home communities and were just kind of lost, right? They didn't fit back in their home communities. But then, let's not mince words, you had a bunch of people that were given an industrial art or some kind of skill which was supposed to get them jobs in white communities, but do you think white communities wanted to hire Native American peoples? No. So you basically created people that don't belong in the white world and have a very hard time belonging to their home world, right? To their home nations. You've essentially created several generations of lost children, right? Or lost adults by this time. So Lup said, no more, we're shutting them down, forget it. He also said that assimilation may not ever be complete. Is it actually a goal we should have to have complete assimilation? Or rather, is this shining city on a hill, like we heard, is it actually the melting pot or the salad? right, that we want it to be? Do we want to be able to at least appreciate some of these cultures before we eradicate them off the face of the earth? He also thought that native arts and language could be used as educational tools to give native kids an actual leg up in the world, right, and not take everything away from them. So he was out there for his time right, in 1905. He was thinking on a wavelength that other people in the Indian service were not thinking. Now his appointment coincided, it happened to coincide with the installation of a brand new superintendent at Grand Junction, a man by the name of Charles Burton. And he didn't know it at the time, but he was destined to become the very last superintendent of the Grand Junction School. Not only did the Commissioner of Indian Affairs want to shut all of them down, but Charles Burton was not a very conscientious employee. He was not the best superintendent in the world. And so because of his personality, because of how he managed the school, he hastened the closing of Grand Junction perhaps a few years before it would have naturally been closed by the Indian service. A general decline in all aspects of the school occurred as a result of Burton's tenure. Here's an inspection report from 1909, okay? So as an Indian training school, the non-reservation class, this is the, one of the Indian Affairs inspectors, I would recommend the closing of Grand Junction, blah, 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 blah. To attempt keeping it up would mean, in my judgment, a change in superintendent and a complete reorganization, right? I do not regard Superintendent Burton as a man who could accomplish this. So they put this guy in charge and he was terrible at his job. He mismanaged funds, he uh, let all like class where they were, there was literally, they were down to two teachers during his time. He um, spent a lot of time out trying to recruit students, leaving the school with nobody in charge. And what was told like the blacksmith teacher and all that, they would just like basically leave the school. If they didn't have, their boss wasn't there, they're just like, forget it, we're out, right? We don't, we don't wanna be here either. And so only when the boss would come back, would they get back on campus and be like, everything was fine, right? So the school was a mess during Burton's tenure. Both Colorado campuses were slated to be closed in 1910. Burton 
wrote a series of letters to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs imploring them, imploring the commission to keep the school open for Navajo children. At the time, there were only like two or three schools in the Navajo Nation, and so there were not enough seats in these schools to educate children, educate, right? To educate children, and so he said, look, we can take advantage of it, right? We can have all these Navajo kids sent up to Grand Junction because we've got the school here. It's perfect. Literally begging the school to stay open, but because of his mismanagement and because of Loop's general, um, Francis Loop's general uh, attitude towards the Indian schools, that plan was rejected and the school was closed, okay? At that time, these campuses were offered to the state of Colorado to take them over, okay? Before we leave this one point, I do wanna say that another thing that makes researching the Grand Junction School so difficult is that there are a series of letters that indicate in no uncertain terms that before Burton left the building, literally, he burned all the records from the school, okay? He was, he was specifically to take out the stuff from one of the previous superintendents, because the previous superintendent wanted his records, but then everything else from the very beginning was burned. So only the things, the correspondence that were back and forth between the school and Washington, D.C. survived. All right, so the schools, the campuses themselves were offered to the state of Colorado. It came with some terms. First, Colorado would maintain the properties in perpetuity. They would hold on to them forever. Two, the institutions would continue to be maintained for educational purposes. Three, any Native American people could come to that school and get free tuition. Tuition came free of charge to any of these Indian schools that were donated to the state. Why does that keep happening? Okay. What, what is happening? Okay. Colorado agreed to these terms. They said, you know what? That's right on. We'll do that. Heck yeah. And so they got both schools. Once Colorado agreed to those terms in May of 1910, they just shut Fort Lewis down. They said, okay, Fort Lewis, you're done. They had very few students at the time. It was not a very big school ever but they shut Fort Lewis down immediately. They sent a bunch of students up to Grand Junction, a bunch of um, like a printing press and some other things up from Fort Lewis they sent up to Grand Junction. But Grand Junction itself closed a year later in June of 1911. <clears throat> for whatever reason, and I can be a cynic about this, for whatever reason, Grand Junction was allowed to rot. All of the educational dollars that Colorado had said they were going to spend to maintain these educational institutions, all of them went to Fort Lewis. Um, the reason for that is not as altruistic as you might imagine. The reason is, is at the time, they thought the Fort Lewis School, which also was on 400 acres of land, sat on top of a major coal bed. So they wanted to maintain access to that coal bed, right? So they kept the Fort Lewis School open, but they left nothing for Grand Junction. And the, Grand, the Colorado legislature essentially said, well, they gave us the land anyway, they gave us the buildings anyway, who's gonna stop us from not doing anything with it? And that's exactly what they did. And during this time, the citizens of Grand Junction vandalized the buildings, stole everything of value, like literally ripped piping out of the walls, and ended up, I mean, I'm sure there are toilets and sinks in some of the old houses around here that are from the Grand Junction School, right? And ended up leaving the buildings in such a state that many of them were condemned. Around the same time, 
There was an agricultural, there are two agricultural canals that still run by this campus today. And those were allowed to run just whatever. There was some kind of uh, opening of a floodgate and essentially just for uh, several months, this entire place was waterlogged. And then it happened to come on a very cold winter that year and it ended up cracking the foundations of many of these buildings, okay? It's during this time, either the flood or the general misuse and vandalization of the campus that we lost the location of the cemetery. No idea where it is. <clears throat> In 1921, the state of Colorado was tired of having this misused campus and people were starting to basically write their legislators and, from Grand Junction and say, what are you doing, right? What is, this, what is this all about? And so the state of Colorado went with hat in hand to the federal Senate and said, would you please let us do something with this campus that is not education, okay? Would you please? We were gonna turn this into a West Slope campus of CSU, the State Agricultural College, but they don't want it. So there's nothing we can do. You have to let us use it for something else. And it had to go to a Senate vote. Ultimately, the Senate said, sure, go ahead. What do you wanna do with it? And they said, we're gonna turn it into a school or a training place for severely handicapped people. And do you know what the federal government said to Colorado as a result of this plan? They said, all right, sounds good. You can do that. But remember, if any native peoples need the services of this place, they come for free. And Colorado said, okay, we'll do that. So in 1921, they turned it into what was then called the State Home and Training School for Mental Defectives, right? It's the 1920s. And when it first opened, all the buildings that were still there had gotten refurbed a little bit and were used as this state home. So all the original buildings of the state home were original Indian school buildings. Eventually, they just outlived their usefulness. The cracked foundations, the cracked walls, the lack of any kind of plumbing in some of the buildings and so on that ultimately they tore a ton of them down in 1936. There are only four original Indian school buildings standing today. Over the years, the state of Colorado somehow forgot about all of its obligations with regard to this property, and they somehow decided that the state home and training school was separate from the rest of the property that the Indian school used to encompass. Now, when, the, when they agreed to take on this stuff, they said, we will take the whole shebang, right? But over the years, they allowed military affairs to take over this area of the property for the armory. They allowed the Department of Veterans Affairs to take over this property for the cemetery. And then this gigantic swath of land right here was somehow, and I don't mean to bite the hand that feeds me, but was somehow sold to CMU. So again, some kind of dealings went on in the legislature that allowed this property to just completely be kind of piecemealed away until it is what it is today, which is just the main part of the campus and this, I don't know, whatever that's up there now, nothing. There's nothing up there now. So at no point did the state of Colorado do what it was supposed to do with regard to this school. When you look out on that aerial photo today, obviously you can't see a cemetery, right, besides the veteran cemetery. We have no idea where those Indian children are we know they're out there somewhere, but is it on the CMU property? Is it somewhere on the main part of the campus? We have no idea. And that's what we need to find out, right? That's where we need to go next, is we have to find that cemetery. <clears throat> 
Here's some historic photos. This was taken not long after the school closed, probably in 1919, something around there. And as you can see here, even in these historic photos, there's no cemetery in the main part of the campus. We don't see anything. So that is the big mystery of this place. Not only are all the records burned, but we have no idea where these sets of remains are. And how disrespectful is that? So, where are we today? Whatever happens to the property, it will be very complicated. Remember that Colorado said it would maintain the property in perpetuity. With regard to Grand Junction, it's already screwed that up. But there is still that remaining piece. And if they look to sell it, that's against the original, of, uh, the original agreements they made with the federal government. So that can be challenged. Right? And again, I mean no disrespect, uh, but I think the placement of the veteran cemetery and the armory could also be challenged. And believe me, if they find the cemetery underneath one of those properties, there will be hell to pay, right? We have to find it. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing for the preservation of this campus. I'm pushing for the preservation of public memory of this campus, and I am definitely pushing for the location of the cemetery so that we can do what's right for these children. Memorialize them in culturally appropriate ways, or what I should actually say is do what their descendants want done with these bodies, right? Do what the descendants want. It's time for you know, other people who are not native to just get out of the way and allow the healing to start with doing whatever needs to be done for these children. Something is working because in 2019, there was an amendment to that original 2016 bill that will allow the school, the, pro the property to be transferred to another state institution. So someone listened and realized that Colorado needed to do what was right and so you can, it can now be transferred. It might not have to be sold. And this is what I want to happen. I'm just gonna tell you straight up, that's what I want to happen. I want it to be transferred to another state entity because I think it's a public learning opportunity. Here's the superintendent's house in the 1920s. It's a cool old 1889 building. There it is today. Right? It's had some additions, it's torn up inside, there's mice everywhere, but it's still there, okay? It's still there. And this is an excellent opportunity for us because not only can we find those children and facilitate doing what's right among their descendant communities, but we can save parts of the, the save some historic parts of this campus refurb the buildings and set them up as a museum of sorts, as a memorial of sorts, as a public learning center, as something that will not allow this history to die, something that grade school kids can be taken to, to learn, right? Or high school kids could be taken to, to learn and tour and remember that this happened to people, right? And that it happened right here in our backyard. So what's actually being done with regard to that? I was honored to be placed on what, what got called the Teller Institute Task Force, a group of native um, leaders, people from History Colorado, people from the governor's office, people from the National Boarding School Healing Coalition, um, and others, and we got together to try to guide policy with regard to this campus. We just finished our work, and right now the Colorado Department of Human Services who, is, who owns the property now, is in formal consultation with the three Ute tribes uh, about what needs to happen out here, and then those consultations will move out to other affected descendant communities uh, as this process grows. So now we're hearing about, or Colorado Department of Human Services is hearing about what needs to happen from Native peoples. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, citizen of Laguna Pueblo, 
also established the Federal Indian Boarding School uh, Initiative. This was in response to the fines of the um, unmarked cemeteries in Canada. And um, her goal is to learn as much as we can about these schools and to make sure that we figure out who's buried where in the cemeteries associated with these schools. This is a huge job, right? I'm just talking about the 25 federal boarding schools. And really, my research is about Grand Junction and, by extension, Fort Lewis. What about the other 22 or 23? I can't add. That's why I'm an archaeologist, right? So <laughs> that, what about the other 23, OK? And then what about the hundreds of on-reservation schools? And then what about the hundreds of sectarian schools as well? Now, I have nothing but respect for uh, Secretary Holland, but she wanted a report on her desk April of this year. And this barely started last year in like something like October. There's no way. It's too much. You see the struggles I have with just one school, much less hundreds. So. She's got her work cut out for her, um, and her people do, but you know, I support whatever they have going on. Hopefully in July, we will be out there with ground penetrating radar. 170 acres, or whatever's left of it, is a huge amount of land to do ground penetrating radar, and will be horribly expensive. But grants have been, um, We've gotten some grants. History Colorado's given some money to do this. The state of Colorado, of course, needs to put in some money as well, right, in order to have this done correctly. And so hopefully we'll be out there with that ground penetrating uh, technology, and hopefully it will work, right, that we'll actually be able to see the graves. Ground penetrating radar is not as good as like, it's talked about on the news, right? It's very difficult to do. Um, but I am cautiously optimistic that the state of Colorado is ready to do what's right based on everything that I have learned and talked to people in halls of power. It seems like this is going to move forward and we will have some recognition and we will have some finding of the cemetery. And um, all I can tell you is to stay tuned because it's all an open question at this point. So... That's all I have for you tonight. I thank you all for your attention, and I thank the Macrina Committee for having me here and everybody else who is part of this as well. Um, I'm very honored to have been here with you tonight. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. <laughs> questions? Yes. In some cases, yes. And this is another really interesting part of the whole of the whole story is I have documents that also there was a young woman who was sick with tuberculosis, but they caught it in time and they sent her home. So it wasn't like they just waited for people to die. So in some court in some cases, yes, the parents were informed. In other cases, we'd have no idea. Right? We have no clue what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, how long do you think it will take for us to find the Indian children's grave? All summer, at least, with the ground penetrating radar. Oh, the question is how long do I think it will take to find the graves? And my answer is if ground penetrating radar is working properly, maybe in as little as a summer. However, if it's not working properly and we need to do other kinds of survey, a year, maybe, it's a big piece of land to have to go through. Yes? Um, well, that's a good question. There are community rumors about where this thing uh, is, and so those are some of the areas that we're going to target first. However, I think we've sold the state of Colorado on, listen, if you want to do it right, we got to do all of it, right? We can't just pick and choose little squares. We have to do the whole thing if you want to be sure. So we think that's what they're going to let us do. Yes? 
The reason why I choose the superintendent's house, and there's one right across the way that's the old matron's house as well. Uh, I choose one of those two because those are right off of Riverside Parkway. So they'd be very easy to get to uh, for any visiting public, right? The other buildings are small and in very poor shape, and they are deeper into the campus. So I think you know things that are, that are visible right off of a very busy street is exactly where we need to go. Yes? Where, which Christian church? The one on campus? The one on campus, it was just a chapel and it was non-denominational. Um, there is one newspaper report where they say, we took the coffin from the chapel and walked to the cemetery. So the cemetery has to be somewhere close to the main part of the campus, but where, in what direction, no idea, right? But, um, it could be very close to there. We also th may be right outside the hospital, but we don't know. Yes? No, uh, in the sense that what would really come under, under the law is this uh, is part of Colorado's unmarked grave law. So because it's a state of Colorado property, that would kick in first. If there was some federal money involved, which you could argue that there is if the Colorado Department of Human Services gets federal money, which they do, right? But if there was federal money involved, then NAGPRA would kick in. But because it's a state of Colorado property, Colorado law is gonna come first unless they, we use federal money to do something with the property. Yes? Again, I, I am going to defer to the tribes and see what the tribes want to have done. The problem with that is, is that as you saw, there are some people there that we don't have any tribal affiliation for. So how will we know that they're going to the right place? We also have no idea without the headstones there on who would be who. We might be able to do some aging on the bones if the tribes allowed us to handle the bones in the first place, right? We might be able to do some, some of that work, but again, being able to put an identity on a set of remains is going to be very hard. Um, so what I think and what I suggest needs to happen or is one of the suggestions I've made is that we fence it, we fence the cemetery once we find it with a nice fence, maybe a nice public art installation or something by a native artist, and then allow that to be a memory garden where descendants from all nations that are affected by this school can come and you know, do what needs to be done there, have their, their prayer cloth and, and you know, the things like that that need to happen out there. That's what I would wish. And you know, along with that could come some really cool things, like we could have um, powwows or other kinds of other you know, uh, cultural events, you know, cultural revitalization events to happen on other parts of that campus, right? That could bring people in and make it, turn it from a place of tragedy to a place of memory and learning and instead of taking away culture, revitalizing culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. We would have to wait to get approval for that uh, because it's, it's controlled by a different department altogether. Second of all, it wouldn't be the best idea to waste time on the veteran cemetery to look for graves when we know that we'll be fooled by the modern graves, right? So it's, that's probably not gonna be one of the low side that we'll look for um, or that we'll look at, but who knows, you know? In some of the areas that don't have graves on them yet, 
it's still a fairly new cemetery. It was put there, I think, in 2009 or something. Um, so if there are areas we can do survey on, sure. Yes. We need to spread the word as far as we can is I think the number one thing. We need to, you know, take this whole uh, Indian boarding school phenomenon and how it happened in Grand Junction out of the shadows and make sure people know about it. So the, the answer to that question is education anywhere and everywhere possible. Because if there's enough people here in the community that care, then the governor, whoever it is at the time, will have to listen, or hopefully, you know, will listen. And if we get enough um, tribal representatives, you know, going through the Colorado Council, Colorado uh, Committee on Indian Affairs, then maybe we can get some push there too. Is there similar work going on nationally with other boarding schools? That's the interesting question. No. No, that's, when this, when the thing in Canada blew up, all of a sudden I was getting requests for interviews everywhere because when you, when you search on Google, like research into boarding schools, what was going on here was the only thing that would come up, right? There was another project that was done in, in the school in Oregon, but that was like 10 years ago already. So this is the only contemporary thing that's being done and then as a result of all of this, I'm not trying to, to throw shade, but, um, <laughs> but as a result of all this, all of a sudden the president at Fort Lewis was like, oh, we're gonna find our cemetery too. But I have never come across any records that there were people buried at Fort Lewis. They might have been, but if there were, it was a very small cemetery. For example, the cemetery at uh, Minnesota Morris, one of the schools in Minnesota, we know only had only, it's still, you know, still kids, seven individuals. And so Fort Lewis is probably gonna be along the same lines. They just didn't have a lot of students at Fort Lewis, ever, right? Oh, go ahead. Wait, okay, so we've heard, Jess, did you have something? Yes, I did. Go. Well, I mean. <laughs> President Marshall here? Um, <laughs> I would hope that it would be transferred to CMU. And I would hope then that CMU would restart that original commitment to offer free tuition to Native students because that's what was intended in the first place. <laughs> Go ahead. If, if there is federal funding that is coming from, from the DOI, I haven't heard about it. And it would probably go to CDHS to begin with. So I don't know that I'd be involved in those discussions. Um, I don't have ground penetrating radar equipment, so um, Alpine is gonna be doing that, I think. So we'll see. But to my knowledge, there has been no federal monies sent uh, this way yet. Hopefully there will be. I mean, can you open some doors for us? <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. The thing about Carlisle is, is well, their cemetery was moved from its original location and placed in another part of the Army Academy but um, they made sure to have all of the headstones go with. So we know who the individuals are at Carlisle. And so it was much easier to make sure that those bones would be repatriated, those remains, sorry, remains would be repatriated to the right people and we wouldn't have the unknowns that we have here in Grand Junction. Wow, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It's the same one. 
Yep, same piece of ground. No, they, they just tore down the buildings and built new buildings. Indeed, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, the Indian School actually owned another 10 acres on the south side of Riverside Parkway. We don't really talk about this because we don't know what happened out there besides that they own it. But it's right underneath the juvenile detention center now. And um, if you look on the property ownership of Mesa County, you can see that it still says, it doesn't say, you know, Department of Corrections or anything like that, it says State Home and Training School, that's who owns the land. So it's still there. Yeah, perhaps, yeah. I think once we figure out, get a little better idea of what needs to happen with the cemetery, right? Then it might be, well, let's petition the Board of Trustees or let's petition President Marshall and see you know, where we can go with that. Yeah. Go ahead. There, to date, I have not been able to find a single map or photograph or anything showing where that cemetery was. And I'm talking about, you know, plumbing map. When they drained the ground, there was a whole new map made. There was another map made, you know, as some of the buildings got torn down. There's um, Sanborn fire maps from back in the 1920s, like old insurance maps. None of them have the cemetery on it. And here's another weird thing. So I contacted the, the archives here on, at CMU, the special collections, because the oldest map that I could find from Grand Junction, of Grand Junction here, was 1962. So wait a minute, it has to be an older map of Grand Junction in the archives at CMU. Oh yeah, there was 1955. <laughs> so I haven't even been able to find a map like a USGS map or anything like that that showed, you know, they used to have like a little cross or it would say cemetery on it. Not even anything like that. It's just a complete mystery, really. Yes? I was just wondering what would happen if they did find that cemetery because they didn't know where it was. What would that mean? It, well, it depends. If the, if the cemetery is still intact, i.e. it's in one of the places that has not been disturbed by modern grave digging, right? Then it could still be fenced. It could be probably taken out, parted out from the veteran cemetery. Um, but if it has been disturbed or removed as a result of the new graves being dug, the veterans' graves being dug, then um, the tribes and Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs are already just incensed about all of this anyway. Southern Ute in particular is just, at some of the meetings that I was involved in, just ripping people up one side and down the other about this. And so I am sure that there would be lots of litigation involved. Um, because again, it's just, it's adding insult to injury if they just removed these things and didn't tell anybody, you know? Because that's what it would amount to, is they just did it for all intents and purposes under cover of night, you know? All right. Oh, still more. Okay. <laughs> These will be the last two. Then we all have to go. Go ahead. Is it possible that the insurance deal was not involved with the um, that would be That would have to be figured out. If it's going to be contracted out to a professional firm, they'll bring their own people. So um, I don't know right now. Could there be, you know, some internships with regard to helping to um, uh, read the data? you know, or do data entry and stuff like that, maybe, but I can't say at this point. Okay, where was the last one? Go ahead. I've never seen any from Grand Junction, 
in particular, but there are a lot of oral histories that were taken about some of this stuff. And books continue to come out, but if there is something hiding in the archives, either here or in Denver, I have not found it yet. So maybe, you know, one can cross their fingers, but I wouldn't cross them too hard. Yeah. All right. Thank you all very much. Once again, I want to thank, uh, ask you to help me thank uh, Dr. Seabach for all of his work and his uh, talk this evening. Um, it's really been um, inspirational, I think, for, uh, for CMU. We're on the cutting edge of doing something right, hopefully. So thank you very much, Dr. Seabach. So, one, people were asking what you can do. One of the things you can do is leave here and share these stories with people you see. Go talk to other people. Ask them if they've ever heard of this place. Find out if they know anything about it. And if they don't, you become the ambassador to start doing that. And, and I think that's going to make a big difference. I'll also, until we get free tuition for Native peoples here at CMU, we still need scholarships. So just another cheap and shameless plug for the Macrina Scholarship. Uh, it's with the foundation. If you ask them for the Macrina Scholarship, uh, they will help direct you towards a scholarship that will help. And our goal is to someday not need those scholarships because we will make, make changes that we've talked about. So thank you again very much for your time and coming out this evening. And go share this story with as many people as you can.